It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My um, the question uh, to the Premier. Premier, why are you unable to table a budget by March 31st, the end of the fiscal year? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, we are, we are working on bringing a budget forward, Mr. Speaker. I know the Leader of the Opposition knows that there is there's a lot of work involved in uh, putting together a budget, Mr. Speaker. We have been, we have been gathering information from people around the province. Order. Another point uh, to the member from Leeds Grenville: You'll not talk while I'm standing, and the member and the Minister of Rural Affairs will come to order when she's answering. No comments. Answer, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I know the, mem the uh, leader of the opposition knows that there is a lot of work that goes into putting a budget together, uh, making sure that we gather information from people around the province, Mr. Speaker, that we make the right policy decisions, and then uh, and that we put the right initiatives in the budget, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the, the leader of the opposition remembers that when his his uh, party was in office, Mr. Speaker, that every single PC budget was tabled in May or June. Mr. Order. I'm, uh, I'm attempting to get order for your leader and your tackling. Cut supplementary. The Premier should obviously check the facts. In fact, I remember us bringing in a mini budget because we faced a jobs crisis in this province in November of 1995 to actually balance the books and put people back to work in the province. So I understand now the Premier says she won't have the budget by March 31st. Because it's a lot of work. Order. The Premier says that it's a lot of work. But quite frankly, Premier, you've had a year to do so. And if it's too much work for you, then I'm willing to take it on. My team is willing to take it on. We're ready to bring in a turnaround plan to go back to work in our province. And we're facing a jobs crisis in the province of Ontario. There are one million people out of work. We lost 3,000 manufacturing jobs again Question. last month alone. Premier, stop the dithering. Stop the delay. You've got a job to do. Do it. If you won't, we will. We need to turn around by Ontario. Can you see that, please? Can you see that, please? Thank you. Premier. Well, and if you want to see how quick I'm going to be, try it again. First of all, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that there is an enormous amount of work going on already in this province to make sure that people have opportunity. More than 8,000 young people have a placement and a job opportunity, Mr. Speaker, because of our youth job strategy. We are drawing business to the province. We are partnering with businesses, Mr. Speaker, to bring them to the province and help them to expand. So that work is ongoing. We are putting forward an aspirational, practical document, Mr. Speaker that Remember our budget from, from will be and we will introduce it. We will introduce it, Mr. Speaker, in this House. We will bring it to this House, unlike the member opposite whose budgets have been introduced outside of the House when he, they were in government. And, Mr. Speaker, this will not Answer. be a mini-budget. We are bringing forward a full-fledged budget, Mr. Speaker, and we will bring it forth in due course. Supplementary. You know, I don't think I'd... I don't think I'd find myself saying this, Speaker, but it makes you long for the days of Dalton McGuinty and Dwight Tonko. They actually brought budgets in by March 31st. I mean, you, you, you can't even hit that standard. Premier, I, I don't think you understand. We've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs in this province. Ontario desperately needs a government Minister of the Environment to implement come to order. a turnaround plan immediately. The Ontario PC Party, we have that plan. It's called the Million Jobs Plan. So today, we're tabling a motion in the House. You'll either call a budget by March 31st. If you don't, then implement our jobs plan. Yep. But if you choose to do nothing, if you choose not to act at all, we want a confidence vote. Enough is enough. Let's get on with the job. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you, Premier. 
You know, Mr. Speaker, this is uh, this is just another gimmick that the leader of the opposition. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. He knows so well that there is work ongoing, Mr. Speaker, to create opportunity in this province. He also knows Minister that when Rome his government was in office, 1996, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2003, go. May 7th, May 6th, May 5th, May 4th, May 2nd, May 9th, June 17th, May 22nd. That's your record, Mr. Speaker. That's his record. We're going to bring in an aspirational, practical budget that will create opportunity and security for this province. We're not going to succumb to the gimmicks of a party that That's never it. did the same. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, Leader of the Opposition. You know, Premier, here's what I'm worried about. I, I think that you have, you have no jobs plan. You have no turnaround plan. You seem to be running in circles and chasing your tails, and that's not going to put a single person back to work in our province. No one. I, I met a um, small business owner named Scott when I was in Brantford last week. Scott, probably early 30s. He had nine employees, a small construction company. Often these small businesses are the, the backbone of communities like Brantford, Niagara, in parts of Toronto. And Scott said to me, before the Liberal government came in, he had nine employees, and now after tax increases, energy rate increases, more payroll taxes. He has no employees. I want to see Scott put nine people back to work and Absolutely. even more. That's what my turnaround plan will do for our province. You have no plan Question. Time to actually implement a turnaround plan to help Scott, to help his employees, and put people back to work in the province of Ontario. Let's just get on with the job. Thank you. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, um, I appreciate the question. I appreciate the concern that finally individuals across the way are looking to provide for jobs. What they're looking, however, is going back to glory days of smokestacks, low value added jobs, and you can't compete, Mr. Speaker. You can't go back in time and try to give Scott an aspiration, more hope, more opportunity. You only do that, Mr. Speaker, by investing, investing in the skills, investing in training, investing in infrastructure, investing in maintaining a dynamic business climate, things that that member opposite is not doing instead. He's gone to the Ford Nation School of Politics. Only slogans, Mr. Speaker. Nothing substantive underneath. Ontarians deserve better, and they are, Mr. Speaker. When we table this budget, something for the future, something for them. Thank you. Supplementary. So the, um, the finance minister, who's not capable of bringing in a budget by the end of the fiscal year, he's had a year to do so, tells us that he wants to give Scott an aspiration. I want to give Scott more contracts, more money, more employees on his payroll. That's the difference between you and me. You've got no plan. You know, Toby Barrett and I were there with Phil Gillies, our candidate in Brantford. Scott was not the only one around the table. They all have the same story to tell. Let me give you an example. Part of my million jobs plan, reduce the red tape burden to take off the handcuffs. Bill 119 was one example. You want to increase payroll taxes across the province to put people out of work. I want to bring them down and give people better paychecks with more take-home pay. I've got a plan. So, Minister, let me ask you this. If you have no plan by the end of the fiscal year, will you take ours or will you face a confidence vote? Because enough is enough. We've got to get people back to work. Minister Finance. No, thank you. Uh, so we talk about maintaining a dynamic business climate. We introduce reduction to red tape. We eventually introduce reduction in taxes. We did so in the last, just in the last session for 90 percent of businesses in this province, which they delayed, Mr. Speaker, which we put forward. But let me remind Scott and others out there what happened in 1996 by the Progressive Conservative? They tabled a budget on May 7th. What happened by, in 1997 by the Conservatives? They tabled a budget on May 6th. In 1998, they tabled a budget May 5th. In 1999, they tabled a budget May 4th. In 2000, they tabled their budget May 2nd. Oh, wait a minute. What happened in 2001? Mr. Speaker, they tabled a budget on May 9th. Wow. Better still, in 2002, the members over there tabled their Answer. budget on June 17th. Mr. Speaker, we're going to table a budget on time and in an appropriate manner for the benefit of long term. Mr. Speaker, stay tuned. Thank you. Follow supplementary. You, you know, 
You can say whatever you want to say uh, about the PC government. It was clear what we stood. We did what we said we were going to do. And it was a time that people were actually working in the province of Ontario. We were booming. Taxes were low. Energy was under control. And we led Canada. In I find, I find myself in the unique position of trying to say to somebody who's heckling the member that your own members are being as loud and arguing back and forth. Let's just tone it down, please. You have a wrap-up, please. Energy costs were affordable, taxes were down, we led North America in job creation. All I've seen from you, dithering, delay, study after study after study, and now you're going to kick it down the road a couple more months? Question. We need to turn around the plan now. And Minister, if you're not capable of doing it, I've got a team here that's capable of doing that. I want to be back here. Enough is enough. Let's get on with it. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, Ontario has produced over 600,000 net new jobs. We're on the track to produce even more as a result of the investments we're making, not the reckless cuts that are being proposed over there. Right. Well, give the member, the leader of the opposition, some credit. Oh. He is even more excessive and more reckless. And I'll give Mike Harris some credit for doing what he said he would do. We will not do what they said they're going to do, and he's flip-flopping on that very issue as well. He wants to cut employment. He wants to destroy high-value jobs. He wants to ensure that he attacks working families, Mr. Speaker. He has flip-flopped, and he's only doing gimmicks, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians deserve better, and we're going to continue to provide for high-value jobs. We're going to continue to stimulate economic growth, and we're going to table a budget Thank that you. meets the needs of the people of Ontario and the fortunes of Ontario. Your question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Two years ago, the Liberal government was forced to adopt the fairness tax on high income earners. They had to be dragged kicking and screaming to do it, and they pledged that they would get rid of it as soon as they could. So the government's current plan is to hand a million dollar tax break to Ontarians, Ontario's highest income earners within a couple of years. Apparently, this was the plan yesterday, anyways. Can the Premier confirm that this is still the plan today? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As we've just been uh, we've just been talking about, the Minister of Finance was saying we are going to be introducing our budget. We are not going to talk about it in pieces here in the House, Mr. Speaker. I am not going to uh, I'm not going to respond to a specific question, Mr. Speaker. When we haven't introduced the budget, we will be bringing in the budget, and that budget will be aspirational. It will, as the Minister of Finance has said, it will invest in the people of this province in their skills, Mr. Speaker. It will invest in infrastructure so that communities can grow, Mr. Speaker. It will partner with Member business from Central and, Mr. North, Speaker, come to order. it will create a business climate, as we have been doing, create from a business Pembroke, climate come to that order will allow businesses time. to thrive. That is the work that we are doing, Mr. Speaker. That is the budget that we will bring in. And as I have Member said, I'd be Springville, happy to have a conversation time. with the leader of the third party about that budget. Yes, if you're interested, she has not so far responded to uh, our request to have a meeting. I'd be happy to have that conversation if she'd Thank like you. to, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. The Premier is also committed to opening new corporate tax lo uh, loopholes that will allow Ontario's wealthiest corporations to write off the HST on entertainment expenses and company cars. Now, apparently, this was also the plan yesterday, Speaker. Can the Premier confirm that it's still the plan today? So, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party is picking uh, issues out of the air that are not based in what we are doing, Mr. Speaker. They are not part of any kind of coherent plan. They are not part of any kind of coherent narrative about what she believes the people of this province need, Mr. Speaker. So if she wants to have a conversation about any of those things in context, about what we really are proposing or not proposing, I'd be happy to have that discussion with her. But, Mr. Speaker, I am not going to respond to hypothetical assertions by the leader of the third party because it is not a productive way to have a discussion about the fiscal situation in Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, 
Families are feeling squeezed in tough times, and they are looking for help. But they're having a hard time believing that the same Liberals that hiked their hydro bills, hit them with the HST, and has scrambled uh, to uh, defend tax loopholes for the wealthy, massive CEO salary hikes, and billion-dollar scandals, is actually going to, in any way, defend a beleaguered middle class. The Premier says she wants to do things differently, but trying to raise gas taxes and the HST and then frantically scrambling in the other direction isn't the leadership that families need. Do the Liberals really think that this is good enough for the people of Ontario? So, Mr. Speaker, let me, uh, let me address the issue of uh, um, people who are struggling to make, uh, to make ends meet. I know that, Mr. Speaker, and the leader of the third party can, uh, can, she can again assert that uh, my announcement and our commitment not to raise the HST and not to raise gas tax and not to raise income tax on middle classes, she can assert that that's because of something that she said. Nothing could be farther from the truth, Mr. Speaker. We we have been working on we have been working on putting together a transit fund mr speaker to make sure that we have the revenue to invest in transit for some months and i made the announcement simply because the leader of the third party was causing mischief and fearmongering about what we would or were not going to do so i've made it clear that we are not going to raise those taxes mr speaker but i've also made it clear that we understand that in addition to the 30% tuition off grant mr speaker that in, to, in addition to to the plans for the programs for reducing electricity costs. Thank we you. know that people need investment in transit Thank in this you. province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Well, Speaker, I think the, pr the Premier is uh, protesting a bit too much. We no. have the list of NDP ideas. We just keep ticking them off. Uh, the question is to the Premier, Speaker. Earlier this month, the Premier said that she was shocked by the Chrysler decision to walk away from the, decision, uh, the discussions with the government about Ontario jobs. Like Chrysler, Cliffs Natural Resources also walked away from discussions with the government. Now, this was after the Liberals had promised thousands of jobs at a ribbon-cutting ceremony uh, to announce a refinery in Cape Real. So, can the Premier report any progress on these two files, Speaker? Thank you. Senior? Minister. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm so pleased to hear from the third party finally some discussion about Chrysler, because during those negotiations when we were trying to encourage the investment to come here, they were absolutely silent on this investment. And fortunately, we had the great members, like the member for Windsor West, that was actively working on the ground with uh, labor, with uh, uh, the employees, with uh, Chrysler themselves to land that important deal, and we're uh, we're pleased. Mr. Speaker, that, that Chrysler did make a significant investment both in Windsor and in Brampton. We're working with them and we're re-engaging them, hoping to land that longer-term investment. But, Mr. Speaker, we continue to make these investments in Cisco uh, in December, another important example, 3,700 jobs uh, coming with a $4 billion investment. Mr. Speaker, to this day, yes, I don't know where the NDP party is on that investment or the other efforts that we're making to bring important investments to this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Gee, I guess my staff must have missed it in the inbox when I got Got invited to those negotiations, but I'll have them look, Speaker. I'll have them look. Families are worried about their jobs and their future, and Liberal promises are not going to pay the bill, Speaker, unless you're working in public relations for the government. The Premier is stubbornly sticking to a failing plan, while company after company seems to be walking away. Does the Premier think her plan is working? Minister? Well, Again, Mr. Speaker, I'm not quite sure where the leader of the third party is coming from because we're making important investments in this province to the point where Ontario remains in North America the number one destination on a per capita basis for foreign direct investment. So I'm not sure what more the leader of the third party wants. Investment is coming to this province. I mentioned the Cisco investment. They've remained silent on that. The Ford investment last September, which is securing nearly 3,000 jobs at the Oakville facility for uh, a significant time to come. We're continuing to work with our partners in business and investors overseas to make sure that these investments continue to come, and we're seeing the, yes, the results as well, with, with nearly 450,000 net new jobs created in this province since June of 2009. Thank you. 
Final supplementary. Speaker, for years, the government has been defending the same old plans that have left Ontario's unemployment rate above the national average. The Liberals keep doing the same thing, but somehow expecting a different result to incur. That's why New Democrats are actually suggesting something new. A job creator tax credit rewards the companies that are putting people to work. It doesn't just create more dead money or reward companies that ship jobs out of Ontario. Is the Premier ready to admit that what she's doing isn't working and it's time to look at some new ideas? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, um, I wish the leader of the third party listened to me yesterday Mr. when Finance. I talked about the Job Creators Tax Plan because, well, here, this isn't me speaking about it. This is actually the Obama administration that abandoned a similar plan because a government report estimated in the United States that 92 percent of those hired under a similar program would have been hired anyway. And our, ministry, and our Ministry of Finance has looked at their plan as well. We asked the Jobs and Prosperity Council to look at it. Of course, Jim Stanford from Unifor was a member of that council as well. They they abandoned it, they rejected it, but our Ministry of Finance has estimated, because we're not just talking about net new jobs, you have to actually provide this to all new job creations in the province. It could cost more than $2 billion a year to implement your plan. That's not good. Thank you. You have a question? Member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture and Food. Minister, I know from past experience that the minister is involved when the Guelph University recommends closing Alfred and Kempville Agriculture Colleges. When I was the minister and I was asked, I protected the Alfred and Kempville Colleges because I recognized their value. When Noble Villeneuve, a former member from Stormont, Dundas, Glendary and East Grenville was Minister of Agriculture, he protected yeah. them too. Minister, why didn't you? Order. Member from Thunder Bay, Atacoke, come to order. No, no, no. When I say stop, you stop. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the uh, I know that my critic, the, the member opposite, understands that this is an issue that the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities has responsibility for. I also know that as the Minister of Agriculture and Food, I am very concerned that there are programs in place for young people to be able to get into the agriculture and food industry. Mr. Speaker, it's extremely, extremely important to me. So, Mr. Speaker, I also know that the member opposite knows that we have worked. The, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell has worked so that there is a partnership that has been created for the St. Alfred campus. From Speaker, North and he order. also knows that we are open to partnerships so that understanding that the program is not closing, Mr. Speaker, but that the venue is changing, we are open to partnerships so that there can be a local solution. And I think Answer. the member opposite knows that full well. Thank you. Supplementary. A minute, Minister. Operating Alfred and Kempfield Colleges as one of the four conditions for Guelph in their enhanced uh, agreement to operate, and that is an agreement with OMAFRA, your ministry. An economic impact study of that partnership said that the campuses were crucial to agriculture research, science process, and training development. Guelph is still getting the partnership funds, so if they are no longer required to operate the campuses, why did your government bar bargain that requirement away? The member from the PN Carlton will come to order. The member from Oxford will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. I, uh, I'm not happy to hear that. Minister of Training, College and Universities. Mr. Speaker, it's not by accident that Ontario has one of the top three agri-food sectors anywhere in North America. It's because we have a champion as our Minister of Agriculture, and I would put her record in agriculture up with yours or your former colleagues any day of the week. The member will withdraw. Drop. And he's on the edge. 
Carry on, please. Said, Mr. Speaker, we understand the concerns being raised in eastern Ontario regarding the, uh, the, the Kempville campus. We understood the concerns being raised as well regarding the Alfred campus. And the member for Glengarry Prescott, Russell, has worked very, very hard to ensure that that Alfred campus remains open. I want to thank him for that on behalf of the Franklin and the East. And Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work with the members opposite. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener Waterloo. Much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Uh, Kitchener Waterloo needs all day two way go service. We don't, we don't need empty Liberal promises. The Premier's announcement yesterday is neither all day or two way. It's a couple more trains in a couple more years still going one direction at one time. And it's another example of more promises and delays from this Liberal government. Stop the clock. Come to order. Minister of Education, come to order. You guys haven't figured it out. I'm in the mood. I'm just waiting for the right moment. Would you like to be the first? Please finish. Thank you. It's, it is not two-way and it is not all day. It's another example of more promises and delays from this Liberal government. My question to the Premier, why can't the good people of Kitchener-Waterloo get two-way all-day go service? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, <laughs> that's exactly what the people of Kitchener-Waterloo are going to get, Mr. Speaker, and the people of Guelph and, Guelph and all the stops in between, Mr. Speaker. We are bringing two-way full-day go service, go train service to Kitchener-Waterloo, Mr. Speaker. And the investment that we are putting in place, Mr. Speaker, will create more than 33,000 net new jobs. So it's a, it's a double bonus, Mr. Speaker. By the end of 2016, Metrolinx will add four additional trains, two in the morning and two in the afternoon, to serve the Kitchener Station, and that will add 1,000 additional daily passengers. So, Mr. Speaker, we know that you have to take steps. You have to start on delivering this kind of service. This is a concrete proposal. Mr. Speaker, that we are going to be bringing forward Answer. our budget. What I Just think the people you. of Kitchener-Waterloo need to understand is that the member opposite is part of a party that has absolutely no plan for transit. Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, no timeline, no funding means one thing. The Liberals have no plan to deliver two-way all-day go earlier than 2030. The cities of Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph have been clear. They have called for all-day two-way go train service on the Kitchener line. But rather than listening, rather than investing, and rather than creating 40,000 jobs, the Liberals are stalling and wasting even more time. Just like the last Premier, this Liberal Premier will say anything to destroy Order. their record of delivering nothing. To the Premier, will she admit she has no idea when two-way, all-day go will reach Kitchener-Waterloo? Order. Order. You see it, please? Premier. To speaker. I just finished giving the member opposite a date, Mr. Speaker. I just finished saying by the end of 2016 those trains are going to be in place, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite knows full well that we are acting on our commitment as we have in the last few years, Mr. Speaker. We've invested $19.3 billion in public transit, Mr. Speaker. What is outrageous is that a member of the NDP who has denigrated any plan we've had for transit, who does have no has given us no support in terms of raising revenue, Mr. Speaker, who has no plan for transit, that she would stand up, Mr. Speaker, when she knows full well that we're bringing full-day two-way transit to Kitchener-Waterloo, and all she would do is criticize instead of bringing forward a plan that might actually help to move that plan you see it, please? I, uh...
I find it absolutely fascinating that uh, I hear complaints all the time from all three sides about one side being too loud and then as soon as they start, the other side gets loud. How about if we all just tone it down? No, you don't get the last word. I do. New question. Member from Ms. Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, recently, in fact, a few weeks ago, I was at an elementary school in Mississauga East Cooksville. The name of that school is Metropolitan Andre, and I was there to attend a parent council meeting. And what I heard from those moms that evening, and they were mostly moms, the, the hot topic of conversation was actually multiplication tables. Now, what I heard those moms tell me, Speaker, is they really want their kids to learn creative thinking and problem solving, but they also want to make sure that their kids are learning their multiplication tables and math drills the same way many of us in this legislature did when we were in school. I promised them that night, Speaker, that I would express their views to the Minister of Education. So I'm really Tim. pleased that today I'm able to ask on their behalf and all parents in Mississauga East Cooksville to the Minister of Education, what are we doing Thank you. to ensure our kids have the Thank best you. of both worlds? Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga East Cooksville for the question. The member is quite right. Ontario students are performing well in math. In fact, our results are above the OECD average, despite what the official opposition continues to say. And I'm proud of the gains that Ontario students have made, and I, but I do know we can do better. So as minister, I've heard from business and community leaders who tell me they are looking for graduates who know their math and who are also critical thinkers and problem solvers, which is why we are committed to ensuring there is a balanced approach to math instruction between practice and problem solving, and not simply a one-dimensional back-to-the-basics approach like the Conservatives. Answer. In fact, Ontario's curriculum is very consistent with Quebec's, and we know that it's important for our students to be able to understand math Thank concepts, you. know their facts, and use them to solve problems. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Now, in the last few months, the results for Ontario's EQAO assessments, as well as the international assessments from the OECD, have been released. And there's some really great no news. It's reassuring to see that overall in Ontario, 71% of students are at the provincial standard, up from 54% when the Tories were in power. Wow. Whoa, so we've we done a really good job, and thank you, Minister, for that. But there's always room for improvement. So can you tell this House what we are doing to further improve math scores in Ontario? Good question. Thank you, Minister. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member. She's right. Ontario does have a lot to be proud of when we look at our students achievement and that's thanks to the great educators that we have in our system but we do have more work to do on math we know that so that's why we're investing four million dollars to create new learning opportunities in math for educators including workshops in the summer and incentives for teachers to take additional qualifications courses speaker I know the party opposite believes that the way to raise math scores is to give a merit pay for teachers Teachers that get the best math scores. You know what? We don't believe that will work because we believe that the way to make kids learn better is to help teachers teach Answer. our students to build and apply their math scores. That's why we're investing in teachers and why we're working with the College of Teachers and the Faculties of Education to improve math pedagogy. Thank you. In Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Education Minister. As your teacher's bargaining bill limps through committee, weighed down by dozens and dozens of handcrafted union amendments, the Ontario PC Caucus has made but one request to get this bill passed. We want you to ensure that sports teams, debate clubs, and choir practices are not used as bargaining yeah, yeah. chips the next time the unions decide to hold them hostage. The funny thing is, Minister, that you actually agree with us. 
As president of the Ontario Public School Board Association, you supported that idea. We know this because in a 2001 brief to the government, your report stated, and I quote, a comprehensive co-instructional uh, program is an essential part of the education experience. At that time, you actually listened to parents and students who told you how important co-instructional activities are to them. Question. Since the minister has had some time to think about this over the March break, does she agree with her position before or after she became Thank a politician? You. Yeah, yeah. 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 Actually, it's an absolutely consistent position. We totally believe that co-instructional activities are very, very important to creating a safe and supportive and nurturing school environment. We know that kids who participate in activities beyond just curriculum, uh, that that helps them to succeed. And for many children, it's those extra opportunities that actually present their attachment to school. And if he wants more evidence of my stand on that, if he'd look at all the reports that the Safe Schools Action Team made, which I also chaired, he would find that that is the same position. What we don't agree with is that mandating these things and trying to legislate Answer. will actually solve the problem. Yeah. Working with partners yeah. is what solves the problem. Thank you. Not trying to ledger it. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, if you say something is essential, you will do whatever it takes to get the job done. Yeah. On your government's watch, extracurricular activities were an afterthought, a bargaining chip. Parents and students remember that vividly. The same February 7, 2001 brief suggests that we, and I quote, remove co-instructional activities from the realm of selective service withdrawal, and in brackets it says, work to rule. Minister, there was a time when you stood with students and parents. I can't imagine what it would be like to work your whole life on behalf of students to then turn your back the second the unions tell you what to do. We hear enough empty rhetoric from that party, Mr. Speaker, and students deserve more than that. Will the minister stand by what she believes? Stand with parents and students and safeguard co-instruction activities in Ontario schools? Be the boss, minister, and do your job. Yeah. You stand it, please. You stand it, please. Thank you. Minister. The difference between the member opposite and me is, as he just pointed out, I've been involved in the education system for a very long time. The member from uh, Lampin Kent Middlesex will withdraw. Uh, I got it. Relax. I challenge everybody to, to ratchet it down. Minister. Thank you, because what I know is because I was president of the school boards when they were the government, is they chose to legislate. And when they tried to legislate extra The member from Nepean Carlton will come to order. The member from Lampton Kent Middlesex will come to order. The member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry will come to order. Oh, yeah, you did. Wrap up, please. Yes, Speaker. We had eight years of chaos precisely because they insisted that they could solve all the problems of volunteerism by legislating. By it didn't work then. It Answer. won't work now. Partnerships work. Fights don't work. Thank you. Did you recognize me? Okay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Doctors are outside today urging this government to protect patient care. They are frustrated because more than 1,000 nursing positions have been cut since 2012 and Ontario is falling behind. Given all that the government knows about the vital role that nurses play across our health care system, why does this government keep laying nurses off? 
Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, Speaker, I welcome the question, and I think it's an important opportunity to set the record right. Speaker, uh, we have 20,500 more nurses working in Ontario today than in 2003. Let me repeat that 20,000. 500 more nurses working now than in 2003. We have 4,000 more nurses working today than we did a year ago, Speaker. We believe in the role of nurses, Speaker. We're expanding the scope of practice. We're investing in nurse practitioners and uh, uh, running clinics and working in very important roles throughout our health care system. Speaker, I look forward to the supplementary, but the numbers speak for themselves. From the College of Nurses, we have seen an 18.4 per cent increase in the number of nurses, 20,500 more nurses working today than 10 years ago. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the minister also knows that Ontario has the second lowest registered nurse to person ratio in our entire country. Wow. We know that there is a direct link between patient outcomes and registered nurses' workload. Or, said the other way, when you cut nurses, you hurt patients. Yep. When will this government stop patting themselves on the back and address the problem that they are creating? Minister. Well, Speaker, let, let, me, let me repeat, because maybe, just maybe, the member opposite did not hear the first time. 20,500 more nurses working today than 10 years ago. In the last year, we have added 4,000 more nurses. Yes, Speaker, the health care system is, is, is undergoing a transformation. There are more nurses working in the community sector, Speaker. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for patients. It's a good thing for our health care system. We value tremendously the role that nurses play, and that's why we've continued to invest in more nurses working throughout our health care system. Thank you. Your question the member from Scarborough, Scarborough Agent Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, you and I have an interest in helping Ontario's vulnerable youth. I'm pleased to acknowledge that this House finally passed Bill 53, which you and I brought forward, and we now can see May 14 proclaim as Children and Youth in Care Day, a day each year that we can celebrate their accomplishments and, more importantly, raising their awareness of the challenge that these youth often face. And this is the right thing to do. Minister, children with communication, developmental, and physical disability face many challenges. In my riding of Scarborough Agent Court, I met with many constituents facing these challenges. As a member of the Select Committee of Developmental Services, I heard many testimony from families about the difficulty in accessing services for their children. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can she please inform the House Question. our government's doing in addressing the concern of these families? Minister, children, are you Sources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Scarborough Agent Court for the question and as well congratulate her on the passing of Bill 53 earlier this week. That was great. Having brought it forward the uh, first time and following up on it, I was quite pleased to see that pass. So congratulations to this House for passing that. And I'd like to thank her and the Select Committee of Developmental uh, Services on the work that they've done and the interim report that they've just brought forward as well. The current services we provide to children and youth with special needs make a real difference, but we recognize there's more to do. I know the committee has heard from parents and families just as I have as well. I recently announced the new Ontario Special Needs Strategy. As part of this strategy, we will be introducing a new developmental screen to help identify risks to a child's development as early as possible. We will be hiring service coordinators yes, to sir. make planning for a child's care easier, and we will be integrating the delivery of rehabilitation supports to eliminate service gaps. We know families have an interest in ensuring that we stay track with these changes. Thank you. Supplementary. I thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. I'm pleased to hear that we have brought forward some special needs strategy to make it easier for children and families to access support. In my writing, I often hear families about the 
difficulty they face accessing services, and I'm pleased to hear that we're taking actions. I'm also impressed by the strength and commitment to caring for the children. I want to make sure that these initiatives help families as effective as possible. These initiatives need to include the feedback both from the families as well as the leading experts. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can she also please share with the House the special needs strategy in taking consideration Question. of the advice of the families as well as experts in the field? Here, here. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our new special needs strategy incorporates the feedback that we have heard and certainly is reflected in the strategy. I was, when I announced the strategy, I was at the uh, York Simcoe Children's Treatment Network. And you know, it really strikes a chord, and, and you really see the gratitude when you see parents in the audience with tears in their eyes because they recognize we have listened and we've brought forward a strong strategy. So you've heard that we'll be assisting with the navigation, we'll be bringing forward a new developmental screen, hiring service coordinators, making it easier for families to navigate what is now a very complex system. But as part of this strategy as well, we will be putting in place a, a committee to assist us with the implementation of this. So we will continue to focus our efforts. We will continue to listen to parents and experts as we implement to Answer. ensure that we have all children reaching their opportunities and helping all children succeed. Thank you. Your question, a member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Uh, speaker, uh, my question is for the Premier. Premier, I have to admit it was a bit rich to hear your Go Transit re-announcement yesterday. You seem to have forgotten your government's long list of broken promises on infrastructure projects in Waterloo Region. So let's review. In 2007, you promised you'd build Highway 7. Then you didn't. In 2010, you'd promised you'd build Highway 7. Then you didn't. Then you did. In 2012, you'd promised you'd build Highway 7. I bet you did. But you still I have. bet you did. And let's not forget, in 2010, you promised four eastbound and westbound GO trains between Kitchener and Toronto. But you cut that in half. Oh, Order. Premier, with oh, no. such a long list of broken promises on infrastructure projects in Waterloo Region, why should anyone in my community believe a word you now That's say? That's a very good question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you seated, please. You seated, please. Thank you. Much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it was it was my pleasure to be in uh, Kitchener Waterloo yesterday and to talk to the Cambridge and uh, Kitchener Waterloo Chambers of Commerce, Mr. Speaker, and to be able to talk about the investment that we are going to make in full day two way go service, Mr. Speaker. And you know, it was interesting because there were business leaders and local politicians in the room, and they are all very pleased that we are bringing this forward in our budget, Mr. Speaker. They are very, very happy that this is what's happening. Um, and I know, I know that the member opposite knows he might just have forgotten, but I think he knows that there is property being purchased along the corridor to, uh, to yeah. deal with the, the Highway 7 expansion. I'm sure he just forgot that, but he knows that we're delivering on that commitment as well. So we brought the train to uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be bringing full-day two-way GO service, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be building the uh, expansion of Highway 7. So all of those promises have been made, and they're being, they're being implemented, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier. Premier, let's review your GO Transit re-announcement from yesterday. You gave no price tag, you gave no specifics, right. and you gave no time frame. Sounds like an election. Yet you still want residents in Waterloo Region to believe you. Premier, you are the reason Kitchener doesn't already have full two-way GO service. Oh, it's true. No, look it. Listen. It's true. In 2010, you you were the transportation minister. You cancelled the project. Now, nearly four years later, you claim you want to undo your broken promise, but only after allowing another two years to pass. Premier, do you really think it's fair to coerce the residents of Waterloo Region into voting for you by promising the same another go transit promise. commitment that you cancelled nearly four years ago? Wow. Question. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Well, I remember very clearly 
being with the uh, Minister of Government Services when we uh, announced the, uh, the GO train service to Kitchener-Waterloo, Mr. Speaker. I remember very clearly the uh, enthusiasm for that, and I know, Mr. Speaker, that, uh, as I said, the business community and the elected officials yesterday are very pleased that by the end of 2016, Metrolink, uh, Metrolink expects to add four additional trains, two in the morning and two in the afternoon, to serve the Kitchener uh, station, and that that is a concrete move forward to implementing full-day two-way go. Mr. Speaker, since 2003, uh, this government has invested $19.3 billion in public transit, $9.1 billion in GO Transit, Mr. Speaker. Under the previous Conservative government, between 1999 and 2003, there was virtually no money invested in GO Transit, Mr. That's Speaker. Really like there was no expansion of service, really like Mr. Speaker. So, the fact is, we are listening to the concerns of people in this province. We know that integrated transportation systems are what are needed, Thank and you. we are delivering those, and we will continue to Thank do that, you. Mr. Speaker. Good question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the people of Hamilton are increasingly alarmed about the Ministry of Transportation's proposal to close portions of the Burlington Skyway this summer. Ministry staff suggests that the closures will take place overnight on 18 weekends and affect the Toronto-bound Toronto traffic. The proposal suggests that closures will take place between this spring and the fall of 2016. Speaker, has the ministry been told that the province is hosting the Pan Parapan Games next summer and that the venues include Welland and Hamilton? Thank you Finance, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the member's comments in regards to the Pan Am and Parapan American Games, something that's going to be tremendous opportunity for tourism, attraction, and more importantly, Mr. Speaker, infrastructure spending. And I understand the concerns you have in regards to transit and getting people around the Greater Golden Horseshoe. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid concern. It's one that we're addressing here with our Minister of Transportation, as well as our Minister responsible for Security, ensuring that people in the province are safe, ensuring that we pe move people more appropriately and more effectively, and that will require some amendments and some changes to some of the lanes and some of the closures in the meantime. But, Mr. Speaker, it's going to be an investment in our future, and Ontarians are going to be proud of their athletes performing in the Pan Am Games. They're going to be proud that they're going to have venues, community centres, and yes, auditoriums sir. and stadiums like never before. That is a legacy that's going to be left Thank to this you. province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. I don't know what that's got to do with the bridge, but anyways, Speaker, not only will these closures have a significant impact on the citizens of Greater Hamilton, they will negatively impact our tourism partners as well. With concerns raised by city councillors in Hamilton about the rooted, rerouted traffic impact on our beach neighborhood, which has an 80-year-old lift bridge. Uh, during the nighttime closures, there is also concern about the impact of the daytime closures should winds reach 85 kilometers an hour at times on that bridge. I don't recall any consultation with me or my staff or the city of Hamilton with this proposal. I'm gravely concerned, Speaker, about the impact on our citizens, our tourists, our Pan Parapan Games participants. Speaker, will the Premier step back from this proposal until full consultation takes place and the real consultation Question. given to the impact on Hamiltonians, tourism, Pan Parapan Games, and our Hamilton Council? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, um, I actually I attended a number of the announcements in Hamilton when we introduced uh, the refurbishing and the new stadium that's going to be going to Hamilton. Wow! And the mayor was there, and the council was there, and the member opposite was there as well, celebrating the infusion of capital and investment into Hamilton for the benefit of the people of Hamilton and for the people of Rock Island, Ontario. Also, Mr. Speaker. The council and the mayor, as of last week, have been consulted. They are looking at ways to alleviate traffic woes during that construction. Those consultations are being had. Mr. Speaker, and I asked the member opposite if he wishes to involve himself. By all means, you have friends in council. Be part of the solution. Enable us to make this happen. Working together, we can accomplish a lot. I know you. I know you want to be part of this. I know you Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, oh yes, you do. I should have stopped talking. Um, that that 
that is a perfect example of why you address the chair. Uh, and it's a why I would ask if you ask the question, listen carefully to the answer instead of heckling. And I would ask and remind us all, except for the member who wants to give me some coaching, I don't want it right now. If you would all just simply follow the rules, everything would be fine. Thank you. New question. The member from Oak Ridge's market. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture and Food. Minister, my great riding of Oak Ridge's Markham is, as you know, partly rural and home to many farms. I know the farmers in my riding are very concerned about safe farming practices and workplace safety. So I was pleased to hear that the Canadian Federation of Agriculture named last week as Canadian Agriculture Safety Week. Although it is always good to see events that illustrate the importance of farm safety, we need to be sure that safe practice is actually used. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what is the Ministry of Agriculture and Food doing to promote a safe workplace environment on the farm? Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Oak Ridge's Markham for her question. And I know she is always concerned about uh, about these safety issues, and I want to assure her that uh, our government is committed to ensuring that all farm workers and producers are protected, that their health and safety is protected. In fact, the Ministry of Agriculture and Food has been uh, working with the Workplace Safety and Prevention Services for over 15 years. Our goal is to reduce the occurrence of workplace injuries and illness on Ontario farms, horticulture. And landscape operations. Canadian Agriculture Safety Week actually gives us an opportunity to reflect on the work that we've done to improve our safety record. And working with rural affairs, uh, there are a number of ongoing safety initiatives. We have Agriculture Safety Days that focus on safety education and training for children and families. Um, my ministry is pleased to work with uh, Workplace Safety and Prevention Services with a transfer payment of $120,000 a year, Mr. Speaker, and that's specifically intended to ensure that its programs yes, and information sir. are available to all families and to uh, all farmers across the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you uh, Minister, for that response. It's good to hear that the Ministry of Agriculture and Food is working so closely with Workplace Prevention Services and the Ministry of Rural Affairs to further ongoing farm safety initiatives. As we all know, agricultural work is often hazardous and can lead to serious workplace injuries. People in my riding work in the agricultural sector and face these inherent risks each and every day. I understand that in 2006 our government extended the Occupational Health and Safety Act to include farming operations for the first time ever. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell my constituents what else our government is doing to protect the health and safety of Ontarians who work in our agricultural sector? Minister of, minister. Labor. Minister of Labor. Thank you very much, Speaker. I thank the member from Oak Ridge Markham for uh, the very timely question. Speaker, uh, we value the hard work that our farmers do every single day to make sure that local food comes to our table. Yeah. The Ministry of Labor has 200 trained inspectors with expertise on issues inherent to health and safety. <coughs> Speaker, the Ministry of Labor will continue to conduct both reactive and proactive um, visits to farms across the province. To address and continuously improve farm safety in Ontario, the Ministry works with the Farming Technical Advisory Committee. Speaker, among many targeted initiatives, the Ministry has produced eight guidelines to help employers in the farming industry. Further, Speaker, the Ministry has included farming operations as a targeted sector for several blitzes, Answer. most recently in 2003, in our vulnerable new and young worker the speaker will continue to value the work our farmers do and ensure that farming is safe and Thank you. Thank you. Your question is a member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, back in uh, February, the Minister of Transportation addressed the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce about transit in the Hamilton region. Despite his well-documented preference on LRTs in Toronto, hey, his General, comments that order. day were very subdued on whether your government uh, would force LRTs on Hamilton. As you may know, two of your Liberal candidates in the area, Ivan Luksic and Yavid Mirza, are strongly opposed to LRTs in Hamilton. And I find it very interesting the Minister will take a stance on LRTs of any means in Toronto, but has mixed opinions of them in Hamilton. My question is, Minister, uh, Premier, who's dictating the transit policy there, the Minister of Transportation or the candidates whose seats you want to win the next election? Well, Mr. Speaker, 
If the question is about are we going to continue to invest in transit in the GTHA and beyond, are we going to invest in integrated transportation plans? Yes, Mr. The Speaker, we are Oxford going to do that, which I would just remark is and from Nipissing, Pembroke, standing come to in order. stark contrast to what the opposition Leeds, party Greenville, has put order. forward, Mr. Speaker, which is no plan to invest in transit, which is no support for developing integrated Prince transportation Hastings, plans. Come to On order. the issue of the uh, the particular modes of, of public transit, municipality by municipality, there are local discussions. There is no doubt about that. There are local dis discussions in Toronto, in Kitchener-Waterloo, in Ottawa, and in Hamilton, Mr. Speaker. And municipalities need to Answer. work to determine what is going to be the best mode for their own communities. That's why we work in partnership with municipalities, Mr. Speaker, as we make those investments. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Premier, you've just said it, and your minister both uh, talk about respecting local decision-making, yet your government uh, railroads municipalities at every turn. And I want to draw your attention to a letter I wrote to the minister on March 6 about the Niagara GTA corridor. The Mid-Peninsula Highway would bring thousands of jobs, alleviate congestion, and enhance cross-border trade. Local bodies, including the Municipality of Niagara, the City of Hamilton, the Burlington Chamber of Commerce, and many more who represent the local interests you've been talking about, all strongly support this project. Yet, the Minister of Transportation addressed the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, and he dismissed the project as ridiculous. Oh Premier, God. I have to say, do you support your minister? And if so, why do you think local decision-making is important for LRTs in Hamilton, yet unimportant for projects that would lose thousands of jobs in the ha Hamilton Niagara region? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation about the Mid Penn Highway. And you know, there have been there have been many, many opinions expressed. The ministry has recommended building a new highway connecting 406 near Welland to the QEW near Fort Erie, Mr. Speaker. That recommendation has been done. But you know that the, he know, the, the member opposite knows that there has been a, a more contentious discussion about a, a, a larger project. But Mr. Speaker, I do believe that local input is important. I also believe that making sure that we make these investments is important, Mr. Speaker. And and it's very interesting that the party that is advocating cutting and slashing and not investing in the province, Mr. Speaker, that is talking about not investing in infrastructure, not investing in people, and not investing in communities, all of a sudden has members who are asking questions about making investments that would cost millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is, we are going to make those investments. We are going to work with communities, and that stands in stark contrast to what they. Thank you. New question. The member from Beaches East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Madam Premier, each year for the past 26 years, hundreds of thousands of music lovers have descended on the beach at Queen Street East for what has been described as one of the 10 best jazz festivals in the world. The Beaches Jazz Festival has grown bigger and better every year, and hundreds of local volunteers work with the director, Lito Cellelli, and his team to create this phenomenal event. Last year, 500,000 people attended. For the past seven years, the festival has received funding from the Ministry of Tourism's Celebrate Ontario program. Can the Premier explain why this ministry and her minister has rejected Question. their grant application for wow. 2014. Thank you. Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, I um, I would be happy to uh, I'd be happy to have a, a discussion with the Minister of uh, Tourism, Culture, and Sport. I don't have I don't have the details on uh, on this particular on this particular investment, Mr. Speaker. But what I do know is that there are hundreds of events and festivals across the province, Mr. Speaker, that receive funding. That we uh, each year we look at the applications. The ministry looks at the applications, Mr. Speaker, and those decisions are made. I'm happy to get back to the member on the specifics of, uh, of this particular issue. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it is true there are hundreds of applications made, but this is the largest jazz festival by far in the whole province. This festival generates $65 million into the Toronto economy and over $30 million of that right in the beach area. Wow. The, the entertainment is free of charge. 
Classes and workshops are held for aspiring young musicians, and world-class entertainers appear on our doorstep that everyone can enjoy. Speaker, I don't think the Ministry or the, or the Minister of Tourism has properly assessed this application. Will the Premier intervene? Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as the Premier indicated, she will uh, certainly look into this and. Uh, and get back to the member opposite. But it gives us the opportunity to talk about this highly competitive program, Celebrate Ontario, but the amazing success that it has. And I want to talk about its success. Member from Essex. The um, 22,000 jobs annually each year. The funding through the Ministry of Tourism Culture uh, provides through Celebrate Ontario generates more than 22,000 jobs. And I don't know what the member and the member from said. Hamilton, we're going to get back to and look into it. Unfortunately, the minister uh, responsible isn't here to uh, respond directly. But this is an important program, and certainly the, the, in, the, in the beaches, it's a very important program that we uh, we su have supported for a number of years. Answer. We, uh, we will certainly uh, get back to him on this issue. <laughs> Thank you. The member from Oakville. Thank you. I've got a question this morning, Speaker, for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Great guy. Minister, the members of this House all heard the heartfelt apology from the Premier to the former residents of Huronia, Rideau, and the Southwestern Regional Centres when it was delivered in the Legislature on December 9, 2013. Observers, myself included, Speaker, applauded the Premier for her sincerity. We also commended the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Third Party for their impactful apologies as well. However, Speaker, since then we've not heard an update on other important aspects of this settlement for the former residents. One such requirement was that residents be provided access to their own case files should they desire them. Speaker, through you to the Minister, would you inform the House what is the status of this key settlement? Question. Thank you, Minister. Please. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd be delighted to uh, respond to the excellent question. I'm pleased to share with the House uh, that in order to make it easier for former residents, the government is providing one window access through the Ministry's Freedom of Information Unit. And through this process, uh, no requester of information is required to pay any fee. We brought in extra staff. We've already uh, reviewed over 70,000 pages of documents. To date, there have been 397 requests for personal records, um, and uh, all have been uh, been met uh, and within the timeline prescribed uh, as per the agreement, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, Thank you. The Minister, of, the Minister of Labour on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to correct my record and my response to the member from Oak Ridges, Markham. I, uh, I said that our most recent blitz on for vulnerable new and young worker was in 2003. Speaker, what I meant to say that it was in 2013. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon.